my father said, let Peter enjoy himself. We'll see what happens. And I think he was curious because he knew I liked music. My mother just left instruments all around the house. So I could bang on a piano or an organ or a marimba on a squeeze box or a penny whistle or an auto harp. And at age seven, I was given a ukulele. And I've been into fretted instruments ever then, since then. And in prep school, I joined the jazz band. And then a few years later, my father took me to a square dance festival in the Southern Mountains. And I suddenly realized there was a wealth of music in my country that you never heard on the radio. Old time music, my brother calls it, I think a better name than folk music. All over the place, depending where, are you, where you are, you hear different kinds of old, old time music. And I still feel that uh, I'd like to see people not forget the old songs at the same time they're making up new songs. Do you remember any of the songs that you heard then? Oh, good gosh, You'd yeah. like to play now. I can't, I can't play them. Uh, my fingers are froze up and my voice you hear, I can't really sing anymore. What I do these days, I get the audience singing with me. If I'm singing for children, I'm, uh, needless to say, I said, kids, you all know this song. If you don't, you will in a minute. She'll be coming round the mountain when she comes. Toot, toot. And say, can't you get the toot? Toot, toot. Well, pretty soon they're all doing. She'll be coming round the mountain when she comes. Toot, toot. And the last verse, it's cumulative. So you repeat all the previous things. She'll be wearing red pajamas when she comes. Scratch, scratch. She'll be wearing red pajamas when she comes. Scratch. Scratch. Wearing red pajamas, she'll be wearing red pajamas, she'll be wearing red pajamas when she come. Scratch, scratch. <laughs> yum, yum. Hi, babe. Whoa, back. Toot, toot. And even if the kids never heard the song before, they're doing it with me. Pete, you traveled the South with Alan Lomax, and to a lot of people that may not be a familiar name. Alan Lomax was the son of a Texas fella who collected cowboy songs a hundred years ago. And that's how we know Home on the Range and, and uh, other songs like it, whoopee tie yo And in 1908, he got President Roosevelt, Theodore Roosevelt, to write a short foreword for his book of cowboy songs. 30 years later, he had a son, and uh, Alan was only 22 years old, his father got him installed as the curator of the Archive of American Folk Song in the Library of Congress. And Alan, in a few years, did what most people would take a lifetime to do. With utmost self-confidence, he calls up the head of Columbia Radio and says, you have a school of the air. Why don't you spend one year learning about American folk music? And the Columbia Symphony can play the music after you've heard some old person croak out the old ballad. And if he couldn't find an old person to do it, he got young me, uh, age 19 and 20. And I still sing some of the songs I learned then. It is advertised in Boston, New York, and Buffalo. 500 brave Americans are wailing for to go, singing blowy winds of the morning, blowy winds, hi-ho. Clear away your running gear and blow, blow, blow. <laughs> he interviewed the woman who collected that song when she was a teenager sailing on her father's whaling ship in the 19th century. Now as an old woman, she came out with a beautiful book, Songs of American Sailormen. Joanna Colcord was her name. So he interviews her, has me sing a song, and then the symphony orchestra plays it. <laughs> well, Alan got me started and many others. He's the man who told Woody Guthrie, he says, Woody Guthrie, your mission is li in life is to write songs. Don't let anything distract you. You're like the people who wrote the ballads of Robin Hood and the ballad of Jesse James. You keep writing ballads as long as you can. And Woody took it to heart. He wasn't a good husband. He was always running off. Uh, but he wrote songs, hmm. as you know. Do you remember when you first met Woody Guthrie? Oh, yeah. I'll never forget it. Uh, it was a benefit concert for California agricultural workers on Broadway at midnight. Burl Ives was there, the Golden Gate Quartet, Josh White, Lead Belly, uh, Margot Mayo's Square Dance Group with my wife dancing in it. 
I sang one song very amateurishly and retired in confusion uh, to a smattering of polite applause. But Woody took over and for 20 minutes entranced everybody, not just with singing, but storytelling. I come from Oklahoma, you know. It's a rich state. You want some oil? Go down the ground. Get you some hole. Get you some oil. If you want lead, we got lead in Oklahoma. Go down in a hole and get you some lead. If you want coal, we got coal in Oklahoma. Go down the hole, get you some coal. If you want food, clothes, or groceries, just go in the hole and stay there. Then he'd sing a song. <laughs> when did you form the Weavers? That was after World War II. Uh, Lee Hayes from Arkansas and uh, his roommate, Millard Lampell, and I had started a group called the Almanacs. And I wrote to Woody, said, Woody, we're singing for unions all around. Come on, join us. We're in Madison Square Garden singing for striking transport workers. And so Woody once again deserted his wife, came and joined us. But the, uh, what do you say, the Almanacs is the only group I know that rehearse on stage. We were very badly organized. And after World War II, Lee says, Pete, do you think we could start a group that would actually rehearse? And we were fortunate to run into one of the world's greatest singers, Ronnie Gilbert. She was in her early 20s, beautiful alto voice, uh, and a strong alto voice. I'd have to be two inches from the microphone. She could be two feet from the microphone, and she'd drown me out. Uh, she stood up to three uh, strong-voiced men, and the four of us, however, were about to break up uh, when uh, we did the unthinkable. We got a job in a nightclub. Well, it, uh, a little Greenwich Village place, it's still down there, uh, the Village Vanguard, and the owner paid us a... He didn't want me first. I said, he said, I, I, can't, I can't pay for a quartet. I'll pay for you. I'll pay you $200, like, $200 like I did two years ago. I said, well, what if all four of us were willing to come for $200? That was low pay even then. And he had laughed. He said, well, if you're willing. And uh, we got $200 and free Hamburgs until a month later he came and saw the size of the Hamburgs I was making. He said, let's make that $250, but no more free Hamburgs. And we stayed there six months. Near the end of it, we met an extraordinary band leader, Gordon Jenkins, who loved our music and got us signed up with Decca. And we had a record called and on the other side, the B-side, was a record, Irene, good night, which sprang to number one and for three months stayed up there in the top of the hit parade. It was the biggest seller since World War II. And Can you talk more about Irene? Well, it was the song, the theme song of the great black singer Leadbelly. He died in 49, and if he'd only lived another six months, he would have seen his song all over America. It was an old, old song. He simply changed and adapted it, added some verses and changed the melody, what my father called the folk process, which happens all through all kinds of music. In fact, all culture, you might say. Lawyers adapt old laws to suit new citizens. Cooks adapt old recipes to fit new stomachs. Anyway, uh, I learned this 12-string guitar from Lead Belly. A high string and a low string together, but played together, give a new tone. And the song I really like to sing to you is uh, always have to do with it. I don't sing it anymore. I give the words to the audience and they sing it. As you know this song, to everything turn, 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 there was a season. Sing it. And the whole audience sing, turn, turn. There is a season. And a time, and a time for every purpose under heaven. Time to be born, a time to die. Sing it. A time to be born, a time to plant, to reap. A time to plant, a time to, to kill, to heal, a time to kill, a time to 
laugh to weep, a time to laugh, a time to... You know, those songs, those words are 2,256 years old. I didn't know that at the time, but Julius Lester, an old friend of mine, he's a, uh, I don't know if you know him, he's a, a black man who is officially a Jew. Now, he became fascinated uh, with uh, the Bible, and he, I, I asked him, how, when was these words written? He says, well, the man's name was Kahalath, meaning convoker, somebody who calls people together to speak to them. Uh, in the Greek translation, they called him Ecclesiastes, and they still, in the Ching, King James Version, and this is it. And it's a type of poetry, which is Greek. The Greeks have a word for it, anaphora, A-N-A-P-H-O-R-A. -A, and it means you start off a line with a word or a phrase. You don't have rhyme at the end of the line, but you do have the, it becomes poetry by the way it's organized. Well, I didn't realize I liked the words, but I realize now those are maybe some of the most fundamentally important words that anybody could learn. You see, you and I, we're all descended from killers, good killers. The ones who were not good killers didn't have descendants, but we're descended from good killers. For millions of years, our ancestors were good killers. They say if they hadn't been, we wouldn't be here today. Now is a new period. Now, there's a, there was a time, you might say, the human race needed to have good killers. Now, if we don't change our way of thinking, there will be no human race here. Because science acts very irresponsibly. Oh, and the information is good. Ha, ha, ha. They don't realize that some information is very important. Some, frankly, forget about until we solve some other problems. Uh, Einstein was the per first person who said it. Everything has changed now except our way of thinking. And we've got to find ways to change our way of thinking. Sports can do it, arts can do it, cooking can do it, all sorts of good works can do it, smiles can do it. And I'm of the opinion now that if the human race makes it, I say we've got a 50-50 chance. If the human race makes it, it'll be women working with children. Now these are two very large oppressed classes in the human race. Children doing what the, the grown-ups say they're supposed to do, and yet they're going to have to pay for our mistakes. They're going to have to clean up the environment which has been filled with chemicals, the air being filled with chemicals, the water being filled with chemicals, the ocean being filled with chemicals, and they're going to have to clean it up. And I think it'll be women working with kids that'll do this job in millions of little ways, maybe done in your hometown. In my hometown, we're starting a project to put in a floating swimming pool in the Hudson because now the Hudson is clean enough to swim in. Let's swim in it. And if it works in our little town, maybe other towns will do it. In fact, if there's swimming pool, it's like a big netting in the water. So. I confess I'm more optimistic now than I was 50, 58 years ago, 59 years ago when the atom bomb was dropped. I first wanted to be a, a, a mechanic in the Air Force. I thought that'd be an interesting thing. But then military intelligence got interested in my politics. My outfit went on to glory and death, and I stayed there in Keesler Field, Mississippi, picking up cigarette butts. For six months, finally, they let me know, yes, they'd been investigating me, opening all my mail. Pete Seeger, when you came back, they continued to investigate you. Well, I have assumed most of my life that if there wasn't a microphone under the bed, they were tapping the phone from time to time and opening my mail from time to time. Who knows? Uh, but, uh, it, but it was more than that, wasn't it? Oh, well, sometimes they'd have picket lines out, but you know, in a crazy way, all it did was sell tickets. I remember one concert did not sell out. My manager said, Pete, we should have gotten the Birches to picket you, then it would have sold out. <laughs> I'm looking at a transcript of the House on American Activities Committee, August 18th, 1955, um, when they started off by saying, Mr. Tavener said, when and where were you born, Mr. Seeger? 
You actually answered that question. <laughs> well, uh, I wish I could uh, had had uh, been more spoken up more. I just did what my lawyer, a very nice guy, says: don't try to antagonize him. Just don't answer these questions because if you answer this kind of question, you have to have to answer more questions. Uh, just say uh, you don't think it's legal. Well, I, I said I, I think I got a right to my opinion, and you have a right to your opinion. Period. Uh, and so eventually, I was called up, and sentenced to a year in jail. But the, my lawyer got me off on bail. The only, I was only in jail for four hours, and uh, I learned a folk song. They served us lunch, a uh, slice of bread and a slice of bologna and an apple, and the man next to me was singing, if that judge believes what I say, I'll be leaving for home today. The man next to him says, not if he sees your record, you won't. <laughs> but that's an old African melody, you know. It's in many, many uh, African-American folk songs. Now, you were sentenced to a year in jail? And a year later, the appeals court acquitted me. Ironically, the, the, the contradictions of life still amaze me. The judge who acquitted me, the head, of, head judge, there were three judges, had one was Irving Kaufman, the man who sentenced the Rosenbergs to the chair 10 years earlier. But he acquitted me. He said, we are not inclined to lightly disregard charges of unconstitutionality, even though they may be made by those unworthy of our respect. <laughs> However, uh, I feel that my, both my wife and I feel we're lucky to be alive and lucky to be on good terms with our neighbors. And in the little town where we live, people shout out, hi, Pete, hi, Toshi. And I'd like to, I wish I could live another 20 years just to see things that are happening because I believe that women working with children will get men to wake up to what a foolish thing it is to <coughs> seek power and glory and money in your life. What foolish thing. Here we are. Uh, there's a politician in my hometown, a very nice guy. He used to be a shop steward in, uh, for the union in a local factory. But for 20 years, he represented our town in the county legislature. And he said, Pete, if you don't grow, you die. One o'clock in the morning, I sat up in bed and thought of the next question. If that's true, if you don't grow, you die. Doesn't it follow the quicker you grow, the sooner you die? <laughs> Nobody is facing up to that question, but it's, it's very definitely true. Now, the first step in solving a problem is to admit there's a problem. Then we can argue about ways it could be solved. I suppose one person say, well, let a few people have trillions of dollars and the rest of the people obediently do the work and the people in charge will see that everything is done right. Uh, on the other hand, I think what was in the Declaration of Independence is true now just as it was then. Those great lines, they're written by Ben Franklin, you know, not Jefferson. We hold these truths to be self-evident, that all men are created equal, that they are endowed by their creator with certain inalienable rights, that among these rights are life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. That to secure these rights, governments are instituted among men, deriving their just powers from the consent of the governed. That when any government becomes destructive of these ends, it is the right of the people to alter or to abolish it. Pete Seeger, can you tell us about We Shall Overcome? Uh -huh. I thought, uh, in 1946, uh, when I learned it from a white woman who uh, taught in a union labor school, the Highlander Folk School in Tennessee, that uh, the song had been made up in 1946 by tobacco workers because they sang it out there to strike through the winter of 1946 in Charleston, South Carolina. And they taught the song to Zilphia Horton the, uh, uh, the teacher at the labor school. And she said, oh, my favorite song. And I printed it in our little magazine in New York, People's Songs, as We Will Overcome in 1947. 
It was a friend of mine, Guy Carawan, who made it famous. Uh, he picked up my way of singing it, We Shall Overcome, although Septima, uh, there was another teacher there, Septima Clark, a black, black woman. She felt that shall, like me, she felt it opened up the mouth better than will. So she, that's the way she sang it. Anyway, Guy Carwin in 1960 taught it to the young people at the founding convention of SNCC, Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee, SNCC for short. And a month later, it wasn't a song, it was the song throughout the South. Only th two years ago, I get a letter from a professor in Pennsylvania who uncovered an issue of the United Mine Workers Journal of February 1909. And a letter there on the front page says, last year at our strike, we opened every meeting with a prayer and singing that good old song, We Will Overcome. So it's probably a late 19th century Union version of what was a well-known gospel song. I'll overcome, I'll overcome, I'll overcome someday. You sang it for Martin Luther King? In 1957, I went down to Highlander. Uh, Zilphia was dead, and Miles Horton, her husband, said, we can't have a celebration of 25 years of this school without music. Won't you come down and help lead some songs? So I went down, and Dr. King and Dr. Reverend Abernathy came up from Alabama to say a few words. And I sang a few songs, and that was one of them. And Braden drove King to a speaking engagement in Kentucky the next day, and she remembers him sitting in the back seat saying, we shall overcome. That song really sticks with you, doesn't it? But he wasn't a song leader. It wasn't until another three years that Guy Carawan made it famous. Even as you're singing songs like that, it has also often been seen as a tremendous threat to the establishment. And in 1963, the Fire and Police Research Association of Los Angeles warned before one of your appearances, Pete Seeger, that folk music and youth gatherings were being used to brainwash and subvert vast segments of young people's groups. Oh, poor I hope they've learned a little different now. That's 40 years ago, 41 years ago. But the establishment has always been concerned about music. I've quoted Plato for years who wrote, it's very important that uh, the wrong kind of music not be allowed in the Republic. And I've also heard there's an old Arab proverb, when the king puts the poet on his payroll, he cuts off the tongue of the poet. During the 1930s, I was very conscious that uh, radio stations played nice love songs and uh, funny songs, but only by accident did a song like Brother Can You Spare a Dime get through. Other, the other songs tend to be more like Bing Crosby's hit of 1933, I think. Wrap your troubles in dreams, dream your troubles away. That's how we're gonna lick the depression? We're talking to Pete Seeger, and on this allmusic.com bio of you, it says, Pete Seeger's adherence to the sanctity of folk music came to a boiling point with the advent of folk rock, and it's long been rumored that he tried to pull the plug on Bob Dylan's very electrified set <laughs> with the Paul Butterfield Blues Band in 1965. Is that true? No. It's true that I don't play electrified instruments. I don't know how to. On the other hand, I've played with people who play them beautifully, and I admire some of them. Uh, Howling Wolf was using electrified instruments at Newport just the day before Bob did. But I was furious that the sound was so distorted you could not understand a word that he was singing. He was singing a great song, Maggie's Farm, a great song, but you couldn't understand it. And I ran over to the sound man and said, fix the sound so you can understand him. And they hollered back, no, this is the way they want it. I don't know who they was. But uh, I was so mad, I said, damn, if I had an ax, I'd cut the cable right down. I really was that mad. Uh, but I wasn't against uh, Bob going electric. Matter of fact, some of Bob's songs are still my favorites. What an artist he is. What a great, I, I'd say maybe he and Woody and Buffy St. Marie and Joni Mitchell and Malvina Reynolds 
are the greatest songwriters of the 20th century. Even though Irving Berlin made the most money, uh, they, they wrote songs that were trying to help us understand where we are, what we got to do. Still are writing them. 1967, you made your stand against the Vietnam War clear on the Smothers Brother, <laughs> so, uh, the Smothers Brothers Comedy Hour. Can you talk about that? Well, the Smothers Brothers uh, were a big, big success on the CBS television. And way back the year before, I think in the spring of uh, 60, 67, they said, uh, CBS says, anything we can do for you, you're right at the top. Uh, what can we do to make you happier? And they said, let us have Seeger on. And CBS said, <clears throat> well, we'll think about it. Finally, in October, they said, OK, you can have them on. And I sang this song, waist deep in the big muddy, the big fool says to push on. The tape was made in California, flown to New York, and in New York, they scissored the song out. And uh, now the Smothers Brothers took to the print media and said, CBS is censoring our best jokes. They censored Seeger's best song. And they got some publicity. And during November, December, January, uh, the arguments went on. Finally, in February, no, no, pardon me, late January, late January, uh, of 68, CBS said, OK, OK, he can sing the song. On six hours' notice, I flew out to California. I remember singing a batch of songs from American history, uh, songs from the Revolution. Why come ye hither, red coats, you mind what madness fills in our forest? There is danger, there's danger in our hills, for the rifles, boom, ba -da -bum -bum, the rifles, boom, ba -da -bum -bum, in our hands shall prove no trifle. I think I mentioned the hit song of 1814. Uh, it was the hit song. Oh, say, can you see? And the song of the Mexican War. Green grow the lilacs, all sparkling with you, a love song. That's why Yankees are called gringos in Mexico from that song. And, of course, the Civil War, several good songs, not just Battle Hymn of the Republic, but a batch of them. Uh, the Spanish-American War, Oscar Brand taught me this song. American soldiers in the Philippines were singing, damn, damn, damn the Filipinos, cross-eyed cocky drone and beneath the starry flag, civilize them with a crag, and go back to our own beloved home. I didn't sing that. But long come uh, modern times, I sang Waist Deep in the Big Muddy, and this time only a, a station in Detroit cut it out. But the rest of the country heard it, so seven million people heard it. Who knows, later that month, in late February, Lyndon Johnson decided not to run for re-election. Song would be probably just one more thing. I, th I honestly believe that the future is going to be millions of little things saving us. I, I, I imagine a big seesaw. And at one end of this seesaw is on the ground with a basket half full of big rocks in it. The other end of the seesaw is up in the air. It's got a basket one quarter full of sand. And some of us got teaspoons and we're trying to fill up sand. A lot of people are laughing at us. They say, oh, people like you have been trying to do that for thousands of years. And it's not. It's leaking out as fast as you're putting it in. But we're saying we're getting more people with teaspoons all the time. And we think one of these years you'll see that whole seesaw go zoop in the other direction. And people say, gee, how did it happen so suddenly? Us and all our little teaspoons. Now, Grant, we've got to keep putting it in, because if we don't keep putting teaspoons in, it will leak out, and the rocks will go back again. Who knows? Do you see those cracks, those places today uh, in mass media? I know you don't watch TV and all that, but, for example, you going on Smothers Brothers, do you think that it is as constricted today not as constricted. No, there's all sorts of little things going on. I understand this program may be on some TV stations. A 
I've got to find out where, when, so I can see it. Uh, you're right, I don't look at TV much except to check on the weathers for my skating rink. <laughs> uh, and I'm a readaholic, a, a magazine-aholic. I get 40 or 50 magazines a month. And uh, read music magazines, environmental magazines, union magazines, civil rights magazines. Who knows? Mm -hmm.